this event is brought to you not just by National Council of Jewish Women, but you may have gathered from people all around the world that this is a, a joint enterprise. And we have planned this uh, National Council it was very honored to be invited by Itach Maki and the Kiverstein Institute to work alongside them. The other two organizations are both based in Israel. And I, I'll just uh, uh, say a little bit about each of those institutions, uh, those organizations very briefly. Itach Maki is the Women's Lawyers for Social Justice. It's an amazing organization that has been working to deal with the disenfranchisement of Arab and Jewish women in Israel, particularly around peace and security, but not only around peace and security. And they're working hard to ensure that the voices of Arab and Jewish women are heard in Israel. The Kiverstein Institute isn't uh, an organization of lawyers, but it's an, and is a new player on the block. And it's also interested in peace and security, working with both Arab women and Jewish women to bring about peace. And they're working particularly at the moment, looking at uh, political representation and also representation uh, and independence of women through economic uh, independence. In Australia, when we begin an event, we always start with what's called an acknowledgement of country. So I am sitting in Melbourne where I am and the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. They're the first nation people where I live. And this week is a week where we're not just going to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and to pay our respects to the elders past and present, but we're also celebrating what's called NADOC week, which is a week that is specially dedicated to looking at the rights and inclusion of, of First Nation people, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the people who've been custodians of this land for 65,000 years. And we like to learn from this when we're paying respect to the owners, the traditional owners of the land, to recognize that the benefits that we have living in this society cannot be taken for granted. It's required for someone to look after the year, land and the land will not stay wonderful unless we continue to look after it in the tradition that's been established by, in my case, the Bunurong people. And I also want to pay my respects to the elders past and present of all the traditional owners where we are meeting across Australia and First Nation people around the world. We have got the most amazing speakers this evening. Uh, I think that you'll agree. In fact, just being in their presence, just breathe in the air, everybody. And just by breathing in the air, you are going to be taking in greatness tonight because there are so many people on this call, people who are speaking and also people who aren't speaking, who are just have made the most incredible contribution to the society, whether it's to Israel or to Australia. And to world peace, to looking at the position of women, because we know that through the position of women and through empowering women, we can bring about a lot of change. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn, rather than introduce everybody to you at once, because otherwise you'll just forget who's who. So we're going to start off by uh, talking a little bit about the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 and what it's all about. And we're incredibly honoured that we've got Dana Myrtlebaum talking to us tonight. Dana was involved with the Tachmaki many years ago in establishing a program to do with peace and security in Israel. She works currently to promote gender mainstreaming and general gender equality action plans within local government. She has worked in the public arena for the rights of citizens, Jewish women, Arab women, and to help creating space for silenced voices. Dana, it's an honor to have you with us. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Never was a speaker in Australia before. This is my first time in Australia <laughs> ever. Though I have great um, acknowledgement of the amazingness of acknowledging um, acknowledging people who were here before us and acknowledging women who were here before us and acknowledging in our case 
um, the sources and the roots of the conflicts that we share here and this on the same land. Um, um, and we don't do it. Um, so we have to do it in the civil society. We need to do it as women. We need to do it in the peace movement. Um, I'm here um, on behalf of Itach Maki. It's an organization that was instituted in 2001. And we work around the country with women who are marginalized. Um, and those are Jewish and Arab women um, all over Israel. You know, whoever wants to contact me to get the PowerPoint presentation or whatever, you're most welcome to ask any questions. Um, in any of these events, we have this uh, month, like 20 events, more than 20 events for the anniversary of 20 years for 1325, for this um, historical resolution that I will tell in a few minutes about. I just wanna tell some um, personal words that I discovered resolution 1325 in 2004, the beginning of 2004 in one um, snowy night in Washington DC. I was in my studies to become a human rights lawyer. I was already a lawyer and I was part of a gender round table with women from all around the world. And one of the participants from Rwanda, I think, she sent this resolution and I was sitting and reading, it's a one pager. If you didn't see it, you can Google it easily. You have all the languages. And I said to myself, it's unbelievable. It's all the things I want to work for. It's ending the occupation in Israel and it's humanitarian law, which I just started you know, understanding what's the law of the war. And it's being a feminist lawyer and it's everything about what do you do with this paper? And then I started um, a voyage that I was looking to do something with it. So I met women waging peace in DC. And I went to the UN to the first anniversary, like four years for the, for the resolution, hearing stories from around the world of people, what they, what they did in their countries with this resolution. And I really insisted to work on it when I came back to Israel. And then I submitted um, a shadow report to the UN uh, on Beijing plus 10, that was 10 years after the Beijing platform of action, but no one spoke about women in conflict then. And I was really amazed that no one speaks about it. Um, it's really interesting to tell that um, in 2005, Israel was the first country that took this resolution and took parts of it and made a law. There was a law saying that women from diverse populations uh, should take part in making national policies and in conflict resolutions. And the clause of women from diverse background was a big step, a big step forward saying that not all women are the same, that we as women, we bring different voices to the table if we're there, okay? We're now striving to be in all kinds of, um, in all kinds of platforms to do it. So I'll say a few words about uh, 1325. I'll put um, the PowerPoint that my colleague Neta sent me. She had to be here um, today, and I'm I have the, the I'm, I'm delightful to be here and replacing her. Um, just a minute. Second of technology. Okay. Um, so the UN, um, do you see that? Yeah, you see it probably. The UN resolution was the first time that the Security Council, which is in the UN, um, the body that has some teeth, some, some authority, the body that decided to get into Iraq when Iraq was waging uh, war, um, the body that decided to do sanctions around other countries that, that, that wage war, um, so in short, it's a body that has some power in the UN. So it was the first time they acknowledged after um, a lobby of organizations and um, women's organizations to acknowledge that women and girls are affected by violent conflicts uh, in specific ways. Um, and, and, and the resolution speaks about participation um, and it speaks about protection and it speaks about prevention of violence. 
And we say that the resolution also says that women should be part of the solution. Women should be part of, of the negotiation tables, as I said. Um, so, and there is, of course, in this resolution, it's not of course, but it was very uh, um, interesting because it's 20 years ago, uh, there was an acknowledgement of the leading role of the civil society and the consultation that governments have to, to make, not only with women, but with, with civil society, with NGOs that serve uh, women, that serve children, that serve girls. Um, so we don't see the women a lot. Uh, me personally, I don't like the discussion going always to the direction of representation because I believe that um, women should be there as a democratic uh, or as a representative uh, um, uh, principle. But I think more that we need to document more what are the effects of conflicts on women and girls. However, when we speak about representation, sometimes it's the easiest way to get into the discourse. It's easier for me as a, an Israeli lawyer to speak about why women should be there. Sometimes it's easier than speaking about political prisoners, Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli uh, prisons and their rights. And it's easier for me to speak then speaking about the rights of um, peace activists who are um, not, not treated well because they are women and peace activists. And it's easier for me speaking about representation of diverse women than speaking about the nuclear weapon and what it does to the ecosystem and what it does to all of us when we are totally militarized society and we are going and militarizing ourselves all the time and what are the effects of militarization on women so it's easier to speak about representation and we did it a lot in Itachmaki we submitted petitions to court um, to the supreme court and we did many things in order to have 1325 on the table, hoping that if women are there, like it happened in other places like Ireland and like um, South Africa, when women are there, conflicts will get to an end, like happened now recently in Colombia. So um, we were working on it. Um, we were doing other things. Then in, in a certain, uh, after making so many petitions, uh, we also had a coalition of many women um, and 30 women's organizations in order to make a national action plan. We were working like two years and we reached a platform of an action plan and we submitted it to the government. And in 2014, um, a presidential governmental resolution 2331 was accepted and Israel decided to implement 1325 and to have gender perspective in all its um, actions and um, government activities. Um, and it required, of course, lots of documentation and data and all kinds of other things. But unfortunately, in the last six years, the government and all the governments, which are frequently changing here, as we, ch we, we change our closet um, less times than the government changes here. Um, so it, it wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't um, enforced and it wasn't um, implemented. So we said, okay, let's change the discourse. So Itach Maki, along with other organizations, you see um, everyone here, women waging peace and um, the, Adam, um, the Adam College for Peace, we were doing uh, of training of women from all places of society, very diverse women to speak the discourse of 1325, uh, hoping they will get into politics, they will get into places of, uh, of making change and changing their communities. Um, so we've done many things. I don't wanna speak a lot about coronavirus and the effect on women and the connection to 1325 because I don't want to tire us all with this 
ongoing issue of COVID. Um, anyway, I think we are here today to hear about new strategies. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from artists, to hearing from women who are changing the discourse in different ways than we lawyers sometimes and the policymakers and uh, public servants, um, even though I think art is public service in itself. So we're here to hear about new game changers and new ways um, to think about conflicts, what do they do to our lives, our daily lives, and how we can keep this in our consciousness, and uh, even if we are on the privileged side of the conflict. As I sit here in Haifa today, and I'm on the privileged side of the conflict. I'm a Jewish woman, I'm white, and I'm a lawyer, and I'm sitting here and not in the occupied territories and where my sisters are less luckier than me. So um, I'm handing back my, uh, my turn. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dana. That was a wonderful introduction to 1325. Now, a lot of people in Australia probably have not really thought much about 1325, a Security Council resolution that's to do with peace and conflict. And because in Australia, we see ourselves as only living in peace, and we go out as uh, peacekeepers to other parts of the world, and we have women involved in peacekeeping. But one thing you might like to think about is, What's the role of something like a Security Resolu Council resolution on security? What's the relevance of it to women living in peace? Could it be relevant to our lives in Australia as well as to the lives of people living within conflict? And let's take one step further. What do images that we see of women have to do with peace and violence? What do they have to do with it? Does it matter what images, what representation there is of women? Could that representation be a cause of war? Could it be a cause of violence? Could it be a cause of the lack of representation? And these are all questions we need to ask as we go through this evening, talking about different aspects of the representation of women as they are, we're going to see, in the context of this resolution. Now, I should say that I keep on talking about this evening because outside my window, it's dark. In Melbourne, it's now eight, getting close to 8.30 at night, but where most of you are, or a lot of you are, it's morning and you probably think it's very strange, this person who keeps on referring to nighttime. So this is one of the problems of uh, international travel and time travel, and the fact that some of you are appearing in Australia and visiting Australia for the first time, and some of you are visiting Israel for the first time, you get confused with timetables and time lag. Okay, um, I'd like now to introduce uh, Hilary Charlesworth. Hilary is a professor of law. She's an esteemed, a very, very honoured person. She's an amazing uh, woman in Australia who has worked in terms of understanding international law from a feminist perspective, She's one of the leaders in this field. She serves, amongst other things, as a, an ad hoc judge on the, at the International Court of Justice. She teaches at Melbourne University. She's taught at other universities as well, but more importantly, her contribution to the field of international law and particularly a woman's perspective on international law is incomparable. So Hilary, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Melinda. And thank you to Itach Maki for inviting me. I'm truly honoured. I'm really thrilled to be here. It seems magic to me that I'm speaking to people all around the world, but particularly in, in Israel. So thank you very, very much for the invitation. And I want to acknowledge, as Melinda has done, the traditional owners of the land where I'm sitting, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for your wonderful introduction, because that's just a perfect uh, background for me. I'm going to try and screen share but this is I'm I'm a very um uh I hope is is that working uh no not yet is that working it's coming up now yes it is well okay, done great yes well this is really um Dana has given us that in 
valuable background to 1325 and what it does. But let me just say that what's very striking this year, um, since 1325, there have been, uh, depending on how you count, eight or nine further resolutions that form the women, peace and security agenda. But I was very struck by the fact we all expected the one to be adopted for the 20th anniversary just uh, two weeks ago. And very strikingly, and I believe for the first time, the resolution failed to be adopted. It was a resolution Russia uh, was the pe so-called pen holder in the Security Council. And it negotiated a uh, or fail to negotiate, depending on your perspective, a resolution that was acceptable. So the unusual situation came about that there were five positive votes in the Security Council for the resolution, but there were 10 abstentions. Uh, and so this meant that the resolution wasn't adopted. And uh, so I, I note that despite the value of 1325, the women, peace and security agenda is in some sort of trouble if there couldn't be a resolution uh, adopted this year. And partly the reasons for that are very interesting and perhaps we can go into those in question time, but uh, it was seen to be a very problematic resolution from the perspective of 10 members of the Security Council. Uh, now, Dan has already pointed out, so he, here is the Security Council this year um, at the time of the debate. So Dana has already very helpfully set out the main themes in the so-called Women, Peace and Security Agenda that's been inaugurated by Resolution 1325. And I, I, I won't go through those again. I just want to note a few features of 1325. First of all, um, it, there are references to gender. There are no references to men. Well, there's one reference to men um, uh, and that's in the context of demobilization. But uh, it's, it's, it's one of, I think, the problems with the resolution is that it completely assumes that women and gender are identical. So that's, that's, that's one of the, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, one can analyze some of the difficulties within the resolution, but we have to acknowledge, and I think the work of Itak Maki is a perfect example of this. I've been looking at the wonderful website and a lot of the videos and talks on the website to see, um, and Itak Maki is not alone, that civil society has actually, I think the greatest advances have come from the picking up of this resolution by civil society um, to formulate demands for political and disarmament processes. But at the institutional level, we get every year, the Secretary General of the UN since 2010 has published as a report every year on how is the women, peace and security agenda going? And it's just striking reading those reports every year, how much the, um, the secretary generals tend to be quite frank and just use phrases such as persistent implementation deficits all the way through. So there's a general acceptance that we've got this resolution, but countries have been very, very slow to take it seriously and to implement it. And Dan has already pointed out some of the issues in terms of actual representation of women. But uh, the argument I just want to make very briefly, tonight, the argument I want to introduce is that I think one of the problems that's slowing down the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security project itself is that it's built on contradictory and impoverished images of women and of men, and the fact they're very rarely there. So on one hand, it depicts women as agents of political change through whose task is to prevent and resolve conflicts. Um, and there is a certain typecasting of women as peacemakers. So in a way, it seems very instrumental. We need more women involved in peace processes somehow because women are just more peaceable than men, which is, which is a problematic assumption. On the other hand, the resolutions present women and girls and children as a group with special needs, requiring protection by a strong and read for that male authority to determine the proper measures for their security. So, as I've mentioned, the elision in the resolutions of the terms women and girls on the one hand and gender on the other, I, I think is very significant. There's no suggestion that those terms might mean something different or that gender might encompass 
expectations of masculinity as well as of femininity. So let me then turn to what I'll call the visual economy of the women, peace and security agenda. I think uh, it's important whenever we look at images that represent this agenda, and you can see I've got even on this slide, I don't know if you can see there's an image of a woman wrapped into 1325 there. Yeah, and uh, if you, I, I won't dwell on this one because I want to spend um, the short time I have on another image, but I think it's quite a problematic image of women. If you look at it, it's clearly a Western woman. Um, I actually think it looks like a woman in a hair shampoo advertisement. And if this is the promise of women, peace and security, um, it's extraordinarily limited. But I think we need always when we're looking at images, and if nothing else comes through from my talk this evening, this is the point I'd really like to make. We should always observe what is highlighted, what is hidden within the frame, what perspectives are represented, and what views are obscured. And I think if we pay attention to the visual, we can see an ambivalence in the images here about women's roles in conflict. Now, usually, um, uh, scholars of visual culture point out that as soon as you have women and children, they're the quintessential victims in all humanitarian imagery. They signal passivity, innocence and nonviolence. And if you had depictions of groups of men, they're, they're very rarely read in that way. But I want the, the image I just want to dwell on is this image, which is on the cover of Australia's National Action Plan. Now, before I've, I was very struck by the story about Israel's national action plan. And before you think, isn't Australia terrific? We have a national action plan. Let me tell you this, it, you can see the end date here, 2018. Um, the government has promised us that they would do an up-to-date plan. Nothing has been seen since 2018. The government formally extended it to last year, but then it's gone completely off their agenda. But I, I so that's a, that's an issue in itself. But let me just look at that particular image that was used by the government to illustrate its national action plan. So this is a photograph of Australian soldiers in Afghanistan taken by an official army photographer. So I assume that the point of these images is designed to reassure the reader and civil society that Australia is delivering on its commitments under Resolution 1325. So we can see here two figures in camouflage uniforms speaking to an Afghan woman dressed in a full black burqa. She has a young girl, possibly a daughter at her side, wearing a vivid green headscarf over a colorful salwar kameez. I don't, can't quite work out what the child, um, the girl child is carrying, sorry, it's, it's a fairly blurry photo. That's just a, um, when I've expanded it. Uh, so one soldier has a machine gun slung over her shoulder in profile and the face looks to be friendly, underlining, I take it, the benign nature of the encounter. And we can't see a lot of the other uniformed person, but they appear to be wearing a headscarf under their helmet. Now, it's striking to me that the Afghan women and the girls are only viewed from the back. There is, I think, a young boy there too. The sex of the soldiers isn't clear from the image, but if you see the photo credit, it tells us that this is Corporal Jenny Sapwell of Mentoring Task Force 2 and an interpreter chatting with local Afghan woman, women in Uruzgan province in southern Afghanistan. So I take this image to be trying to emphasise Australia's progressive attitude to the inclusion of women in its armed forces on the same terms as men. So here's a woman soldier serving in Afghanistan, smiling at the locals and yet carrying a powerful weapon, but she's part of what's called a female engagement team. So she, that main soldier that we can see in profile, stands in contrast to the faceless Afghan figures whose clothing marks them as pre-modern and engulfed in custom. So this is far from a chat, an encounter between equals. It seems rather a meeting of two different worlds, one of women, the Australian soldier who've achieved equality with men and the other of a traditional society where women are veiled and oppressed. So the intention of the image might be to show that the military missions such as the Australian forces in Afghanistan can deliver peace and security for women, but it certainly implies that this is going to be a top-down exercise. It's us advanced people coming to bring enlightenment 
to you over there. Corporal Sapple's military weapon underscores the inequality of the engagement, so she offers a type of friendship that's backed up by military superiority. I think the children are there uh, to signal the Afghan women's peaceable natures. The other image from an Australian perspective is that it anchors the women, peace and security agenda firmly in foreign lands where, and I'm quoting here from Australia's National Action Plan, women and girls face devastating human rights violations, including high levels of sexual and gender-based violence. That's why we Australians are there. But of course, that description can readily apply to Australian society and the idea that we have to go abroad to find these serious cases of human rights violations against women. So the women, peace and security agenda for Australians is something that we pursue resolutely offshore. And uh, we can see here, uh, it allows enlightened military women from the global north who can travel abroad and deploy force along with their male colleagues. Uh, and yet they still have a special value through their entree with local women. So we're told that the female engagement teams we see depicted here, um, and this is a quote from the plan, are able to bridge the cultural gap where most Afghan women are not able to be engaged by the predominantly male security forces. So this view of women soldiers as less confrontational than men and less able to get broader access to security issues across traditional societies is very broadly held within the UN. But we can see, I think, that the engagement as such is very limited. The Australian woman soldier seems inaccessible in her high-tech military cocoon, uh, while the Australian's Afghan interlocutors appear as silent, shadowy figures trapped in tradition. So I think the overall message I take from this is that women from the global south are the main victims of conflict and are the primary beneficiaries of the women, peace and security agenda. They are the quintessential spectacle of victimhood. Women from the global north appear only in the guise of security providers. Now, I, I, I will end now, but I just, I have an, another image that if there's time we might come back to discuss another image, I think a very problematic image, but one used everywhere of women, peace and security. Um, but let, let me just reflect on what work these visual images are doing. So the visual plays a very important role in the international circulation of ideas. Images of conflict follow a set of conventions regulating what can be shown and what can't appear. For example, it's acceptable to show images of the injured or dead if they're from the global south. The picture of the three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi, his body washed up on a Turkish beach in 2015, made headlines in media around the world but it's not possible if victims are from the global north. For example, no images of dead or wounded people were televised after the attacks on the United States on the 11th of September 2001, or after the later attacks on London and Paris. Visuality is critical to the women, peace and security agenda. And I think women, peace and security imagery has its own set of visual conventions. So uh, in my argument, uh, the visual imagery reproduces the limitations of the agenda. I'll perhaps just stop sharing my screen there. Um, and uh, it reproduces uh, existing asymmetries of power. In this way, I think the women, peace and security agenda, the visual imagery provides a narrative for international intervention. Uh, The UN's very slow progress then in achieving the women, peace and security agenda goals, to me, suggests that its members, the UN's members, have become practiced at women, peace and security rhetoric, but are unwilling to go further than this. So I want to end with a question, and I thought this uh, would uh, provide a nice segue to Gull's images, which I've had the good fortune to have a preview of. Um, the question is then, I've told you a rather critical story about the visuality of the women, peace and security agenda, but it leads to the question, well, can visuality, besides offering these limited images, can it also offer techniques to deepen the emancipatory potential of the women, peace and security agenda 
by destabilizing its standard categories. And Gal has got a wonderful set of images to, I think, give us all hope. Thank you. Please give Hilary a, a, a wonderful round, round of applause. Thank you so much, Hilary. Now we've had a request that it, could you please put that image up again on the screen, the one that we were going to use as a poll, but our polls have disappeared. So um, we're not going to have any questions that you get to answer, unfortunately. But uh, Hilary, if you can put that one back up and share that screen again, that would be great. The other thing is, I fail to say that we would like to encourage a conversation here. We've got a lot of people speaking, but there are a lot of you out there who aren't formally on the agenda, but you are on the agenda. Um, if you'd like to put questions into the chat, you can put questions into the chat. If there's anyone who's got a question they'd like to ask now, they can do that, but otherwise we'll make sure anything that you have uh, to ask that you'll have the opportunity to ask. So this is, a, this is uh, an image that, uh, uh, you know, poses a very interesting question that Hillary and I and Hillary and I were discussing earlier. The question about what does this tell us about a women peace and security agenda? What is the image showing? Is it what we want to have shown in a women peace and security agenda? Okay, so. As I said, please put questions into the chat and we can address them to anyone in particular or uh, to, uh, 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 to generally to the various speakers. Also, please feel free to share your email in the chat. Dana has just sh shared hers. And so feel free, if you'd like to be in contact with anyone, please also send information and we'll try and get messages to everybody and everyone of course can read the chat. So our next speaker is the absolutely amazing, I've told you, I've got, I don't know if I have enough superlatives to describe all the speakers we've got tonight. Um, uh, Gal, Dr. Gal Harmet is a feminist art critic and educator uh, extraordinaire. She has worked in the area of peace, gender and peace education. She does peace building through research, gender sensitive uh, um, peace work, gender mainstreaming. She's written a book called Intersectional Pedagogy and Creative Educational Practice for Gender and Peace, which I'm working my way through at the moment. That's not to say that other of our speakers also haven't written books and I'm not uh, discriminating against them by not showing their books. Uh, just as I said, extraordinary people with extraordinary ideas. She also manages a startup a social startup called The Generator. I'm told that she, if you're very lucky and you're in Tel Aviv at the right time, she might take you on a tour of the art gallery and give you a gender tour of the art gallery as well. Uh, Gal will have to uh, tell us whether that's something that she can do or, or not. But let me introduce you to Dr. Gal Harmet and over to you, Gal. Hi, thank you so much. I'm touched. Um, I'm currently in Tel Aviv. Um, which is a very complicated place to be at the moment. And um, we're dealing with complicated issues. And what I thought will be relevant for all of us um, at this point in time is to, um, to have a little bit of an optimistic talk um, with you all. And what I chose to examine is women, peace and security and representation in public sphere, which is extremely uh, politicized and uh, pessimistic. And what I chose to concentrate my 20 minutes on is positive development and a little bit of visual manifestation of change. Because I think that we should, when we're talking about women, peace and security critically, which is very important, and I will because this is my profession, um, we always need to measure what we uh, achieved and how much, um, how much um, everything changed in the last 20 years. And this is what I would like to touch upon. Um, and I'm gonna start with an um, enormous sculpture that is now put in Latvia 
um, in, in a main square. It's a medical profession female who is welcoming the sick and the people who need protection by medical uh, professions into a hospital. And when we're talking about public space, especially sculptures in public space, what I will concentrate on today, we um, oftentimes asking questions of what we would like to commemorate or what is important in our, in our discourse. How would we like to remember or to, to um, make visible of certain um, topics? And this is one that I think is important. But we, before we're touching on positive solutions and development, I would like to share a little bit of where I'm from. And if you join my gender tours, um, you will start right here. This is the Tel Aviv uh, Museum of Art. It's a contemporary uh, art museum. To my right, if I stand in front of the museum, I'll find the, the Tel Aviv court. To my left, the, the municipal library and the, uh, and the theater. And behind me, an enormous, or the main military base of, of Israel, where decisions are made without women, um, on behalf of women, on women, but with no real representation. Um, and in the center, we have um, a huge, probably four meter um, long sculpture of, um, of a woman line. It's a Henry Mou from uh, 1970, and it's called a nude line. And, and I'll take you through what I see. So she is lifting her pelvis. Do you see her pelvis lifted? Um, spreading her legs, she's naked. She has the, the, um, um, her bone here coming out and her breast, she's lying on her head. And what she doesn't have is a name or a context or a head. So we have a woman who is just, that is just a body of a woman without any name or context or a head. And I am looking at, at this sculpture as an educational text. I would like to read it critically as a text. And what do I learn every day when I cross by this sculpture? And every day I'm thinking, Am I beautiful enough to go and teach in university? Am I impressive enough? Am I thin enough? Am I taking enough space? What is my role? Do, does it matter what I say if women in my space don't have names? Right in front of her, she has three sculptures of only men with only hats. And we'll see in art, at least in Tel Aviv, but I'll show you around the world. We, uh, part of the Zoom magic is that we're gonna go into a virtual tour around the world is that men is represented by a head and when they have body it's an active body of a warrior we know we all know the the man with a sword on a horse which i'm not going to show you but i'm going to show you a little bit of men images and how active they are and women are oftentimes are passive headless nameless and just like um just uh, to resonate uh, Hillary's fantastic analysis, they're always needy. They're in a role of, um, of health. They're together with their children. So it's one word, women and children. We're gonna see it a little bit, and then we're gonna look at, um, at alternatives. So just a little bit of context, Gorilla Girls, um, created an art piece in front of the Metropolitan Museum um, in 85, asking do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum? And the answer that less than 5% of the artists in modern art are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. And we'll see that uh, around the world, about 85 of the images that are in public spaces paid by public money, means your tax money, um, are naked and headless. Um, and I'm gonna ask a little bit of questions about that. And we're gonna look at how this transformed in the last four months. 
So this is my least favorite art piece in the world. It's not true, but for the sake of the argument, it's a Rami Meiri's city wall painting um, that portray men or teenagers looking at women's showers. And it's um, next, to a, next to a beach called Peeking into Showers. And those are the women and girls showers. And for a decade or so, feminist organizations and individuals created all kinds of interventions, calling it rape culture, um, asking women and teenagers to put the name of the rapist on as a graffiti on the painting, which they did. And um, about two and a half months ago, the municipality of Tel Aviv decided to erase um, this painting when men groups are, are, are crying and whining, saying that you can't present anything anymore, you can't talk, you can't hit on women, you can't be funny anymore. But they decided to erase it officially after a very long, a decade long struggle of feminist organization. Um, graffiti on that and the municipality erased the graffiti and kept um, the painting. And it's part of a phenomenon that, that is happening in the last five months. And this is more um, hopeful that coronavirus increasing activism in, among women group and changing a little bit the, the public sphere um, norms. So let's look at the norms before, um, before the last six months. In Central Park, uh, Prague, in the uh, Czech Republic, we have a woman in a very subordinated position. She's naked. It's a modern um, uh, sculpture. Um, she's submissive um, in the middle of the street. What do I learn when I cross by her? What images come to my mind? I'm thinking of police brutality, but also on sadomasochistic sex and subordination of women. She, she looks almost like a UN brochure that, um, or a website that Hillary uh, mentioned, how a, a woman from the global south should look like when she's being helped by a brave soldier, either male or female. This is sculptured by Dan, Dan Harris, and it looks like a traditional, um, maybe Renaissance sculpture, but it was uh, positioned, it was made and positioned in uh, 2019. And we see again, um, like 85% of the women sculptures in public spaces, a woman who is naked spreading her legs, her breast is perfect, she's very young and she doesn't have a name or a face or a context. She's just lying there waiting to decorate our space and to be sexy as a social or, or as a sexual price for the heroes. If women are presented somewhat active in public spaces, is normally as mothers. So women position in, in, in public sphere is oftentimes as a decorative um, sculpture very passive or as a mother. This woman is breastfeeding in South Korea and she's very happy to breastfeed. And this is the reason why she's naked. This is the reason why she's there. And we're learning that breastfeeding is making women happy, which it which is and very healthy. Uh, but is this the only um, position I wanna see women in? When we look at naked men in art, um, I brought three, um, three examples from New York, Florence, and, and Paris, the pursuits of the head of the Medusa. We see that women are very, men are very active while they're, um, while they're naked in public sphere. Um, the story is that a smart woman, my story is that a smart woman resisted um, rape and abuse by military and as a punishment, 
um, her head was uh, cut off, she was beheaded. And the sculpture appeared in a lot of European capitals in public spaces where men are naked and, the, and the, 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 their body is a spectacle of war, while her body is a, a spectacle of the ultimate enemy that, and defeat. And after we, um, we looked at a little bit what's, what's the norm, what's the 85% that is happening in, in all over the world, I would like to look at some alternatives that appeared in the last four or five months. Rosalie was, um, was a slave who in the Caribbean, um, she was owned by a man who raped her, he forced her to, to have sex with his friends and she got pregnant. And while she got pregnant, she got angrier and angrier and she resisted and she freed um, some of the female and male slaves that came with the ship to the Caribbeans, burned the, the ships and um, started a, a revolution or started a rebellion acts against her, the person who thought is her master. And she was caught by soldiers while she was pregnant with this man, uh, from this man. And she was kept in prison till she gave birth to his son because the son is his. Um, and then she, was, um, uh, then she was killed as a capital punishment in a very big public humiliation. And um, Oh, nearly 150 years later, um, to, oh, nearly 200 years later, her uh, sculpture was uh, put in Paris last month to commemorate her heroic act. And a fee black female slave who, who rebel against the colonialist and hegemonic power. It was shocking to me to realize that she's the first black woman sculpture in Paris, which is unbelievable uh, for, for a colonialist country like France and sort of progressive discourse that they're having within the feminist discourse. So it was put um, five weeks ago in Paris. Another phenomenon that happened that I would like to touch on is sculpture that represent hegemonic male power of colonialist. Edward Colston was a, um, was a slave owner and, and trafficker. Um, he was a thief who, who um, conquered um, people's uh, countries and states and areas and stole a lot of their goods, but also cultural heritage and brought it to the Bristol Museum. And in June, 2020, a group of uh, Black Lives Matter activists um, took off his sculptures. Um, this is where uh, stood on it a little bit as an act of humiliation and threw him to the river. And the interesting part is not what they did to him, but what they put instead of him. This is where I wanna to touch on alternatives and how much I think the manifestation of change is visible in front of our eyes. The world is changing. 1325, representation and, and integration of women from diverse group of uh, people into public discourse is, is just here. And, um, and uh, Jane Reed, together with Mark Quinn, created uh, Jane Reed's sculptures, standing with her black fist, um, having her natural hair with her um, contemporary dress and tights. Um, she was melted from a bronze that is um, super dark as a request because she wanted to have the darkest version of herself in public space, um, taking his place, taking 
uh, Colton's place in Bristol, and the municipality of Bristol wasn't sure what to do with it. First, they brought the police and they um, were very violent towards the demonstrators. Then they took the sculpture off and threw it to the garbage and uh, Black Lives Matter hired, uh, rented the um, truck and put it back and the municipality took it off. And now it's back on as part of a struggle of the public space. But for me, as also a, a symbol of women taking their space in, in, the, in, the, in the public sphere. Um, that's Bristol um, in June. In July, the municipality of London decided to take off by themselves their own initiative, Robert Melligan uh, sculptures from the public sphere and put it in some basement. Robert Melligan is a colonialist, is a, a trade, uh, he traded slaves and trafficked people across the Atlantic and into Europe. Um, and he also filled the British Museum with treasures. Um, different activists tried to um, intervene with his sculpture and then and the municipality decided that before he's being thrown to the river, they're gonna take him down and nothing is replacing him yet, but Paris put Rosalie on the podium instead of another colonialist. So we'll see what happens there. And I think this is the time if you're, um, if you have time and energy to, to write a letter to the municipality of London and suggest what can replace this, the, uh, his um, sculpture. Um, same phenomenon is happening in Copenhagen a decade before because it's in Scandinavia. Mary Thompson was presented instead of um, of a colonialist symbol um, in, in, um, in the port where she's welcoming the ships coming from all over the world. She's wearing a slave dress. On one hand, she's holding a torch, a symbol of a rebellion or, or a resistance. And on the other hand, she's holding a, an African symbol of of royalty and decision-making. And this is, um, and this is uh, Dunita Donaldson. Uh, Dunita Donaldson was a um, Holocaust survivor living in Sweden. And when she saw, um, and when she saw neo-Nazis marching the street, um, she couldn't, she, she was very angry and she uh, wanted to intervene. And the only thing that came to her mind later, she talks about it, is that she took her purse and she hit them with her purse. And they got, and she started to scream at them and they got scared and ran away. And it's a long story because she was criticized heavily and then the municipality was criticized for standing um, uh, and supporting her. And, and then she, um, and, and the municipality of this town, it's a very small town in Southern Sweden, decided to commemorate her and put a symbol or a sculpture of Dunita Danielson in the main square. And it's the only sculpture I know of an angry woman. Women are oftentimes passive or very beautiful or laughing or being an amazing mother, but they're never ever angry. And, and Dunita Donaldson's sculpture is somewhat angry and she's beating the neo-Nazis and the neo-Nazis are not in the, in the sculpture. And I think it's important because we oftentimes have hegemonic male militaristic power in sculptures and suddenly it's um, changing. A um, few more. A few years ago, um, Kristen uh, Wiebel put uh, a picture or a sculpture of a fearless girl in New York in front of the bull in Wall Street as a symbol of women's resistance and girl resistance. Um, and look how active she is and the power she has in her feast, putting them on, on her, um, on her um, um, uh, waist. 
and other pictures um, I'm running out of time so other pictures uh, other sculptures that are um, put recently in the last two months in New York in Central Park women actually talking to each other which is nearly unheard of um, in uh, be before but like a, a year ago and um, one of my ultimate favorite right now, um, a sculpture called Reaching Out um, of a black girl with a natural hair and um, authentic clothes of a teenager playing with her phone in a park. And we don't have images of women just doing something, being busy, sending a text, listening to a lecture. And I wanna finish again with the um, with the Latvian sculpture of the health worker because I think it symbolizes. I'm doing a lot of deconstruction of public space and how women are not represented in public space and how women from diverse groups are hardly ever represented and that women are there, men are there to uh, protect and defend women. And, and this is what is being commemorated while women are there to be a sexual price for them. And I think this culture started a phenomenon that, that uh, constructs something different. Women who are professional, who are loving and caring. For me, this is women, peace and security. This health worker who is um, keeping me secure and safe much more than a military man who is there with his sword or with his weapon or with his um, tank. And, and I would like to finish with that. And if you would like to discuss or think to yourself, I would like you to think of your, on your surrounding, on your main square. What is the name of the square? What is the name of your street? At least in Tel Aviv, where I live, 3% of the streets are after women and 97% are after men. Um, women are not presented, but it's shifting and changing. So how would you like to see your main square? What would you like to see there? And um, I would like to see this, my Angelo square, uh, just like in San Francisco. So this is what I had for you today. Um, and I hope you have questions and comments and complaints and come. Oh, and was, I'll read the yeah, That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so very much. You give us uh, a lot to think about, including a level of optimism that uh, if in the last couple of months, and we're talking about in the very short space of time, there can start to be this massive change in the public sphere. And we can start seeing images of women that are women who are both powerful and not warful, not representing uh, um, anger and uh, militarization, and not seeing that the way we need to be powerful in the world is through guns and weapons. And the other way we don't need to be doing uh, seen in the world is by subjugating others. The way those early images of men required the subjugation of a woman in order for them to be powerful. Um, there's been an interesting discussion going on in the chat about, uh, amongst other things, the representation of women in music videos, which uh, is a very interesting parallel. And if we're talking about women and peace and security, we need to know about what are the things that make us safe and what are the things that make us unsafe. And certainly your healthcare worker in Latvia makes us think about safety in a, its quintessential sense. It, you know, what are we all doing in Australia, in the rest of the world? You know, we've had lockdown for six months, but we have no coronavirus now. Uh, we are safe. Uh, and that's a pretty amazing thing. We have all focused on this safety. Of course, it's had all sorts of uh, serious consequences for women, and there have been lots of people who've been uh, very disadvantaged by what has happened. So it's this balance between security and the images and safety and safety in all its different manifestations. I'm interested in whether anybody in Australia has thoughts about squares and naming their streets 
because you know in other places in the world you know the street names seem to be really significant around where i live they're called things like cedar and palm and sometimes you get an indigenous name and we, we have been fighting to have some indigenous representation but uh you know our main square is called federation square you know it's very exciting um so i'd be interested in other australians thinking about that uh public art story uh here because everywhere else in the world it seems to be very important so uh maybe i haven't noticed something that's very significant to others here um is there anybody who'd like to to ask a question at this stage of either of our speakers or continue the conversation in the chat which is happening between everyone if you put if you show that your hand is up I'll sc I'm scrolling through people to see hopefully I'll see if I, you can just turn yourself off mute and enter uh, to say something if you'd like to it's a bit hard with over 100 people to make sure I see everybody We do have a comment in the chat that we also have streets and squares named after royalty. True. So harking back to our colonial past yes. or Lots current. Streets named after men um, who wrote declarations and things. No, but we have Elizabeth Street and Queen Street and that are also named after women. Lots of Adelaides and Victorias and uh, whatever. Anyway, um, I think uh this is a question for australians particularly to think about as for everybody else but uh, but this is a question about what we would like to see in public art and how we would like to see ourselves represented it's something that we can say well we haven't thought about it much and it hasn't it hasn't seemed very relevant but of course it is a place where we reflect who we are as a society and uh we are a very uh mixed multicultural society we have people from I think we have 176 language groups uh, that use the national radio service. There are over 200 indigenous languages as well. So, you know, to what extent Australia represents the reality of who we are uh, is one question. And of course, in Israel and other places, that's also very important. Can I just tell you? That I'm not sure you've seen in the chat that someone's just put in about a recent court case in Israel about hiding women's names on street signs and wanting that the, there was a demand to have the women's first name written in small so you wouldn't know that they were women. Mm. Would someone like to, would someone like to tell us more about that? Mm. Peter, maybe unmute yourself, or someone else unmute themselves. I can tell something because I live where it's happening. Oh, Yemen. fantastic. Thank you, Rotem. Um, it's where I live and uh, there is a Haredim, Haredi, the Orthodox Jews here. So they don't want a woman name because it's uh, not modest or something. So the Washair, um, uh, I don't know how to say. Yeah, the mayor. Mayor. The mayor, yes. Mayor who, who is uh, actually a woman. Yes. Uh, she also religious, but not uh, Haggadit. So she thought that it's a good compromise to arrest the first name. I don't know why. And uh, is, that's all. <laughs> I find it very disturbing. It, it, was, it was actually overturned. They, um, they, they, they uh, took it back, this uh, plan, and the names are now going to appear in, in full, both first names and uh, family names. So it is clear that they are women. Um, and, but this obviously brings forth the um, added complexity of the situation of Israel with the Gordian knot between uh, religion and, and state and the unproportional impact that uh, ultra-Orthodox um, politicians, both nationally and locally, have on these uh, issues. Can I just say uh, um, a comment? Um, I, live, I live in Givatayim, and the mayor of Givatayim has decided and has declared that he was going to call uh, more street names on women. And he actually uh, called the street right in front of theater Givatayim Leah Koenig, at the name of her, of Leah Koenig. And 
there was no big ceremony because it was during the COVID and during the, the um, lockup, but uh, the signs are there and nothing is hidden. Can I just tell you something funny? My name is Malvina. So there's a little street in one of the suburbs called Malvina Square. So there are female names, but there are many other female names there. And we discovered by accident that a, uh, one of the Jewish artists in this community many years ago now uh, had a love affair with someone who had been the city designer of, he was naming streets. It turned out she made a film, the daughter, now, the artist is dead. But the daughter, who is in her 50s, discovered that she was the progeny of this gentleman, made contact with him, and her name is in the same area where my name happens to be. I don't know why my name happens to be there. Not from me. <laughs> it just happened to be a name like that there. Her name is there. Her mother's name is there. Plus, he had three wives and about half a dozen children. And they're all <laughs> in that area. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not after any particular high-powered person. <laughs> Okay, time is time is or is running away with us or has run away with us, and we have got one more amazing woman to uh, for me to introduce to you. We have with us tonight Ada Tuma Suleiman. Ada is the uh, is a member of the Knesset in Israel, a member of Parliament. She is a uh, an Arab woman who is on the uh, fifth place on the joint list and also on the second on the Hadassah list for the Knesset. But she's more importantly a, a prominent feminist activist. She's one of the founders of Women Wage Peace. She's been involved in, uh, in working for women's rights in Israel and for peace for many, many years. She understands the depth of what it means to be a woman caught up in conflict and what it means for a woman to be involved in the peace process. So she's going to help us work out a little bit about how we can go forward from where we are now. Ida. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to meet uh, um, you and to listen to this wonderful uh, presentations that uh, were before me. And now when I am uh, uh, listening to you, Melinda, and I know that we had a little talk preparing for this uh, meeting, um, when I heard the question, how we can go forward, it, it happened now for me, like a, a moment of insight that actually what I'm going to speak about is how to go back and not how to go uh, forward uh, and to connect to the uh, main ideas that brought the feminist movement and organizations in the past to uh, 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 struggle and to put pressure in order to uh, get this uh, uh, resolution from the United Nations and to make the international arena admit and understand that we women uh, um, experience the armed conflicts and the conflicts in general in a different way that we are uh, um, uh, living uh, uh, the circumstances in a different way because of our gender roles that uh, uh, and because of uh, our status in the society, because of our uh, um, exclusion from decision uh, uh, making cycles. And we made the United Nations also understand and the international arena understand that our security is not only is it matters and not only national security matters. And that security for women is not only 
depending on the national security of the states we are living in, but also it is economical, it's health-wise, it's, it's uh, um, uh, uh, against, uh, or it's security from violence, gender-based violence, of security from sexual harassment, and it is depending on the decisions that our governments are deciding every day and affecting our lives every moment. And not only uh, uh, we are affected by the situation in confronting the enemies on a national uh, uh, issue. Why I'm saying this? Because I think that we moved away very much from that resolution. And suddenly I am looking at, uh, at the situation and feeling that we are dealing with this resolution that have a very specific context. We took it out of the context and we are dealing with it as, as if it is CEDAW or it is the, the Convention for Eliminating All Forms of Discrimination Against Women or as part of the general discussion about gender uh, and equality and et cetera. Why I'm saying this? Because uh, when I think about it, we as women, as feminists, we, we always uh, struggle to change the balance of power and to change the hierarchy and the patriarchy that exists in this world. And when we start speaking about gender mainstreaming, actually, what are we saying? We are accepting the hierarchy, the patriarchy, but we want to do gender mainstreaming inside that system. I'm personally working against the system. I want to change the system. I want to reconstruct the system in a way that to create security and peace. And I believe that this is what is wanted when, this is what we claimed when we, and I was part of that struggle to push for this resolution as women uh, uh, organizations. When, uh, you know, uh, there's a very, very nice um, feminist uh, uh, writer, Moroccan uh, feminist writer, who wrote what happened to Shahrazad when she traveled to the West. And I'm asking what happened to 1325 when he traveled to the East and came to Israel. And this is interesting because it is a very interesting uh, comparison, you know. Uh, when when Sharazad uh, went to the West, Sharazad is supposed to be one of the earliest feminists, I think, who fought every night through a story in order to save hundreds and thousands of women of being killed. Uh, and she managed by using her wisdom because it she depended on on telling stories. Uh, and to make uh, the suspense in the right moment so that she can continue next night. She was, she had wisdom, she had, she was clever and she, she actually was, uh, she were willing to sacrifice herself for her sisters, the women. When she went to the West, suddenly she became a ballet dancer and an exotic woman and she was shifted into the main stereotypes about women. 1325 was supposed to be one step ahead where we say we are claiming and we what demanding our security and our and peace. And we have a very clear say how we imagine peace and security, and it is not the model that is built by patriarchy and militarism. And that's why we want to participate. And that's why, because we 
experience the conflicts in a different way. We want to participate in the solution and in the rehabilitation and rebuilding society so that we can build it in a different way. That was the main idea. But when 1325 came to Israel, the first thing we shifted away, the, the, for my regret, the feminist movement shifted away the, the word conflict out of the resolution. And suddenly we are dealing only with representation and protection from gender-based violence, protection from occupation and militarization almost is not mentioned because then we will be challenging the, he, he, the, the, the consensus that is existing inside Israel. When we are talking about representation, we are talking about representation not only in the civil life inside Israel. 1325 is about participation in conflict resolution, in negotiations, and in the struggle against occupation and armed conflict and in the struggle against racism. And if you, if, if the feminist movement in Israel do not understand the relation between house demolishing for the Palestinian citizens of Israel and evacuation of Palestinians from area C under the occupied, in the occupied territories and the racist, and the racism and is not willing to put it on the agenda forward as part of the implementation of 1325 and nationalization of 1325 in Israel, then we are missing the point here. Then we are supposed to start back to reclaim 1325 into the main resource that it started by the feminist idea of building a different world that exists with peace and security the way we perceive it, not the way the patriarchy and military uh, 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 perceive it. So this is, this is why I believe today that we want to reclaim 1325. It's, it's, it's true that Israel was one that maybe the first, if I'm not wrong, the first country in the world that legislated a law that is in the um, spirit and in the idea of 1325, but it was mainly about representation and it was and and i have to say that it is not implemented even the law till now fully and we uh, the, the feminist movement is still struggling for that but there is no national uh, plan for example um sometimes it sounds very uh, uh, strange to be one of the latest maybe countries in the world or states in the world that is still living in an armed conflict and yet do not have a national uh, uh, plan uh, for 1325. Um, one of the demands next week, uh, I'm, um, I was, um, uh, I initiated uh, with the, of course, with women waging peace and and itach uh, maaki, but especially in the in the parliament, I have the right to uh, ask for a special day, and we are celebrating a special day of twenty years of thirteen twenty five in the Knesset, and um, it's it's very uh, maybe you part of you saw me during the meeting. I was like speaking a little bit. Uh, 
as usual, very anxious about something, uh, but you couldn't hear. Um, uh, I was trying to ask for a permission to hold a meeting in the Knesset, and I asked for a meeting about security for Israeli women. And uh, in the Knesset, they sent me asking, what do you mean by security? You mean from violence? You mean a national security? You mean, uh, what do you mean? And I, um, and I was uh, uh, again asking myself, you see, we still have a lot to do in order to make people understand what do we mean when we say security? Even in the Knesset, they did not. And of course, they got scared that I want to deal with, you know, security from the national perspective uh, of uh, security. Um, I think that uh, uh, we, when we are not able to practice our participation and representation in the official way, we should go back to base one in feminist organizing is to do it on a on um, a, a, in the public sphere to do it on a, a grassroots a, a representation and participation and to use our uh, activism in order to put pressure and to change the equation that's what we've done for many years till now. Uh, and, and for my regret, although uh, some nice breeze is coming from the United States in the last two days, three days, uh, but for my regret in our situation, we are still stuck in the bad four, 10, uh, 15 years of, um, uh, of uh, uh, very right wing, uh, anti-human rights approach, anti-democratic approach uh, in Israel. And uh, uh, that's why we are mostly needed now as women who need to fight for human rights. There is no way that we can think about human rights, about women's rights when human rights are not guaranteed. We are part of that system of human rights. We are part of this, um, um, I'm looking for the word in English. Anyway, I, I think you understood what I'm saying. There is no women's rights without human rights. There is no women's rights in anti-democratic atmosphere. And that's why if we are looking for security, for peace, women organizations or activists cannot stand aside and think that we only need to ask for ourselves our rights we need to make the whole political system our problem we need to uh, 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 see that the hierarchy and military and racism all of them are part of the obstacles and part of the uh, barriers which are built in front of us in order to guarantee our rights by the 1325. Now, I believe a society cannot live a normal life as long as it is in uh, um, um, in a, a war or a, a, a armed conflict situation. Even if you are living on the uh, occupier side, if you are living on the very strong side of the equation and the most militarized society and have the ability to, uh, uh, to have the best army, you will always even in that situation, suffer from that equation, especially we as women. There is need to speak about the uh, existing militarized discourse. I always did not understand, and I was attacked many times um, and criticized for this position that I'm taking. I cannot understand those who are asking for equality in the army 
uh, meaning women should be equal in their ability to serve in the army. We are not talking here about Switzerland or uh, I don't know. We are talking about a situation uh, of uh, armed conflict. I don't, I want to see the women in an equal situation to participate in negotiations. But again, we need to ask who are those women who are going to participate in this? Because for my regret, you can look at our women, at most of the women who are in the government and probably will be asked to be in the negotiations if it's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, uh, very soon, uh, which is not. Uh, uh, I, I, there are some of those ministers, women ministers, that I really, uh, 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 one of my nightmares if they are going to be on the uh, uh, negotiations. So a lot of questions are uh, in front of us, but I, I believe that I still remember even with women waging peace, uh, that I support them uh, in their work, but I argue with them a lot. I think that whenever you start a step uh, and uh, you will start to be challenged every day by those questions, what, what uh, and I want to finish with saying again, what we need today is when we are thinking how to go forward is to look back to look back to where we started the idea of 1325, to look back to what we believed in and put uh, in, the, uh, in this resolution as women organizations, as a feminist movement, as peace movement. And we need to reclaim uh, uh, the ideas of 1325 and think about not gender mainstreaming, but changing the whole system. Well, uh, that was just totally mind blowing. A way forward, we need to look at the representation of women in art. We need to look at the representation of women in UN documentation. We need to understand what that representation means. And we need to look at the way representation uh, is actually constructing the society, the way in which women are representing themselves and representing the way forward, what the world should look like through a feminist lens that involves contemplating, constructing, deconstructing patriarchy, a big challenge. And I do want to say to all the people in Australia, do not be complacent and think that because we're not living in armed conflict that we have no problems. We need to work on our human rights agenda and NCJWA are doing some work in this regard as well. We don't have time to talk about it now, but please stay tuned because it's incredibly important uh, uh, what Ada has just told us. It's incredibly important that we look at the way forward in terms of humanity and deal with racism and the other issues that and violence confronting society. Um, Hamil Tal is going to, uh, we are so way over time, Hamil Tal is going to have a few words to round us off. Hi, wow. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Melinda Jones, Professor Hilary Charlesworth, Dr. Gal Harmat, member of Knesset Aida Tuma, and attorney Dana Miltenbaum for this fascinating discussion. Appreciation is a feminist political act, and we should practice it as often as we can. 20 years ago, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 provided us with a conceptual and practical framework. And we are committed to continue improving on it, expanding it, and giving it the feminist depth that it needs and making it relevant and beneficial for women worldwide and for women in Israel and Palestine. We know that we have our work cut out for us. The global COVID-19 crisis is threatening to erase many of the achievements made by the feminist movement worldwide. Women around the world are more vulnerable now and are carrying on their shoulders the well-being, the physical and mental health of their families, communities, and countries. Often, as is the case in Israel, while being excluded from decision-making on how to successfully manage the crisis. Yet, I am hopeful. 
First, because optimism is also a feminist political act. And I'm hopeful because I'm an optimist feminist. I know, I know, this may sound like an oxymoron, but I'm an optimist feminist. I am optimist. I'm optimistic because I believe positive change is possible and is happening. I'm hopeful because I recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants who made our active and scholarship, our political and civil society leadership possible. I'm hopeful because as the proverb tells us, as long as the candlelight shines, we can repair the world. And the candle shines bright and powerful in the minds and the hearts of every single woman and man who are present here and beyond the Zoom room. I am hopeful because with everything that is going on right now, and perhaps in light of what is going on right now, we are committed to being around the table and to engaging in conversation and in actions. I am hopeful because working for social and political change is a labor of love, passion, and compassion. It is also a labor that requires intellectual curiosity, critical thinking, creativity, and agility. And all of these qualities are present in this Zoom room and beyond it in abundance. So again, I'm so appreciative of our speakers and of our participants. Um, we have a lot of work to do and we're moving forward inspired by everything that we have heard today. And a special thank you to one of my favorite feminist fairy godmothers, Melinda Jones, and to Pita um, Jones, my colleague. Thank you. Thank you for making this possible and to Itach Ma'aki, our partners in this. And just to add on top of that, we would be totally remiss if we did not name Ella Alon and Netta, uh, Netta Lurvi who are from Itach Ma'aki and who really were the initiators of this event and have kept silent and have not shown their face and they're not the public face of the event, but they are incredibly important. Thank you again. Let me add my thanks to everybody. Hamutal, thank you. Ida, Hilary, Gal, uh, um, who have I left out? I'm so sorry. Um, Donna, everybody, thank you all. Thank you. Have a great night. And thank you for staying with us this long, long time. Good night. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. for organizing it. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you for facilitating it so well. Thank you. Thank you.